the story sort of starts about nearly 13 years ago when I had uh, cardiovascular disease and bypass surgery. So it was a minor heart attack at the time. I could have died potentially at the time. Listen to your body. I've had to learn that in a hard way to listen to my body and knowing what I should be putting in and what I shouldn't. So that's been a, a bit of a, a learning curve for a lot of us, especially in the modern world where we've lost our food culture, so to speak. But going back, looking at my diet, I realized that I consumed a lot of seed oils. I somehow got convinced in my 20s, mid 20s, that seed oils were, I remember reading something in Scientific America, and I was convinced that was the way to go for heart health. I started using it for a lot of things. So maybe that overconsumption in the end nearly cost me my life. Okay, good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. We have with us a guest today by the name of Harry Serpanos. I hope I'm correct. I'm saying that correctly, Harry. Welcome. Thanks for being That's here. That's correct. Where, where are you located, by the way? I'm in located in Tasmania. Okay. So it's a small, it's a fairly large island mm-hmm. south of Melbourne, yeah. the mainland that is of Australia. Yeah. So you're in the Tasman Sea, just close to New Zealand there. We're, we're New Zealand's to the east and we're to the south of the east coast of Australia. Okay, because yeah, there's a friend of mine, Gary Fetke, who lives in Tasmania. I think he's in- He does, say, in Lana's the northern port. part of the state. Okay. Thanks for what time is it there, by the way? It's got to be some weird It's time. about two o'clock in the morning. Holy cow. Sorry about that. Yeah, yes, no, we could have we okay. very easily done this at a different time. Just I realize get, that. I guess we'll just get started with who you are. For people who haven't heard, I've looked at some of your material out there that you have online. Give us a little bit about your background, if you don't mind. My professional background is in cartography or spatial science, as it's called now. Uh, that's the field that I work in. My the sort of direct work that would have to do with the capture of, of features, which are related to digital maps. So we produce a lot of the digi- digital maps for the state. Plus, we provide what would be called for the state critical infrastructure, digital infrastructure. So it's a, a quite a diverse field. It, it comes out of the engineering faculty, to be more precise, but it uh, gives me the capacity to know how to manipulate data or look at data and stuff like that. About, for me, the story sort of starts about nearly 13 years ago when I had cardiovascular disease and bypass surgery. So it was a minor heart um, attack at the time. And I could have died potentially at the time, but I listened to the symptoms of angina at the time. I wasn't sure what it was. I just had severe shortness of breath. I sat down. I nearly passed out. I had a minor sort of heart incident at the time without having a severe heart attack and dying. And then I got myself the next day to to the hospital and they told me the, the unpleasant news at the time. So it was a, a sort of a long story getting back to health. At the time, I was on a sad diet like most people, just eating a lot of junk food and processed carbohydrates and processed oils. Since my young years, I'd been told that was the sort of the way to go. I, When I was younger, I grew up on more animal foods and then through my 20s, I abandoned them to a large extent and consumed a lot of processed foods like a lot of people do nowadays. And uh, by the age of 44, I'm nearly 57 now, I ended up with cardiovascular disease, which was a shock to the system at the time. After the fact, I realised that a lot of the stuff that I was doing, that I was told was heart healthy and all that sort of stuff, was the stuff that actually caused the problem in the first place industrial seed oils and refined sugars okay fair enough and yeah 44 is quite young for a heart attack and it's not it's becoming more and more common unfortunately certainly so you have a heart attack yeah go ahead i was just going to say considering my great-grandfather left 107 most there are centenarians on my father's side and on my mother's side so there's no genetics so to speak of any sort my father's still alive and he's 88 and a half. He recently had a, a an, an accident. He was struck by a vehicle while walking across the street at that age, but I've had him on a like a 
for the last decade, nearly on a high protein diet, eating more animal foods, less carbohydrates, and his bone density has gone up. He does a lot small weights as well. And this is from my sort of story. I learned how to change the situation and his situation. And he's now nearly 90, gets struck by vehicle, thrown for about th- nearly three metres and doesn't even get, get severe bruising, some ligaments being pulled and stretched. And, and he's you know got a bit of reduction in mobility, a few things like that. But in general, he had no fractures or no broken bones, and it was shocking to the physicians when they discharged him. So it, for me, I was thinking the worst, but after knowing that I'd had him on a number of things like taurine that sort of improves bone density and lowers myostatin, so that sort of has improved his protein synthesis and having him for a number of years on leucine as well, It's made him more robust, let's put it that way. Not that robust for a four-wheel drive or an SUV, as you as you call them in in the US, but still it nothing surprises me about when you put incorporate into your diet far more animal foods. Yeah, going back to when you had your heart attack, you're at 44, obviously very young for that. And clearly it's that's that's and you're right. Many people, the first symptom of heart disease is death. That's something that can certainly ruin your day. But yeah. So what was your evolution? Once you had this heart attack, what, what, what were you told? What did you do initially? And then how did you come to the approach that you currently pursue? Initially, they told me that I was a 5% anomaly, apparently. Also, because I, I realized later on, I've got an APOE of 3-3 and tend to have much lower than other people. I can get my LD, my total cholesterol, so to speak, down to about into the 3.7, 3.2 millimoles, which is way, which is considered like heart safe, which since then I've realized that's just nonsense. It's just pretty much that I uptake polymicron remnant much slower than the hyper responders. And that's just why the numbers are like that. It's just a different type of gene phenotype that, uh, that I've got that, but it doesn't mean that I can't get oxidized LDL like anyone else. LDL is a problem. So you said you had fairly low LDL cholesterol, you know, currently. Well, they told me at the hospital. Yeah. They said I'm a 5% anomaly. They don't know why, why I'm here. I'm presenting. Oh, because you had low LDL cholesterol and yet you still had a heart attack, is what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. okay. And, and since then, I've been on a more animal based diet and it's actually gone up my total cholesterol and my LDLC. It hasn't gone up to the high levels because I said it due to genetics. But at the same time, I've actually reversed my cardiovascular disease. I don't have, I've been using high dose of taurine to break down fibrosis in the body. And and a few other biohacks when you that say I, that I do cover on my channel. When you say you reverse your cardiovascular, disease, what do you mean? What I mean, ejection fraction. I, what I is- have normal blood perfusion now since my most recent scan a few years back, and I also have no heart fibrosis anymore. And when you so say I've been no- discharged by Tasmanian cardio cardiology, I don't present to cardiology anymore on a yearly basis as you. In the, as many other people do, tend to get progress, progressively worse. So the more I've got, I got rid of seed oils about 12 years ago and I got rid of ca- refined carbohydrates mostly about that same time. Not the, like any human that I don't occasionally cheat in social occasions, but generally speaking, I keep it mostly clean and that's helped over the, the last couple of years to to reverse a lot of the problems that I've had health-wise. Just to go back to you said you you've got normal cardio flow through your coronary arteries. I assume was that how was that determined? Was it was that was that some uh, sort it was of a scan? It was a scan. They put some fluid in. I'm not sure exactly. I think it was a. It may have been a CT scan. I could be wrong. Okay, but it clearly showed there was restriction in and around your heart attack and you didn't have, you were you revascularized or stented or what was the treatment i wasn't for? stented i was i just had double bypass surgery 
Okay, so you were revascularized. Okay, so okay, okay. and those will often uh, those will reach to know. We know there's a certain rate for that. I'm glad that you're not having any further restriction in blood flow. That's helpful. So you mentioned 12 years ago. I'm going to cut out the processed food, which. When you do that, you pretty much give up most of this, the quote unquote seed oils because they're in everything. And, and so what was the decision back then to say, I'm going to give up the processed food? Was it intentional to give up seed oils at the time or was it just as a consequence of giving up all the processed food? What happened was initially I did a deep dive into the literature and I came across some studies back in 1983 and 84, and they covered, they discussed about lipid, lipid peroxidation and that it was related to the seed oils. These were academics that were doing independence and you know, they were being funded by industry, so to speak. And I don't remember the exact titles of it's a very long time ago when I read them, but they actually at the time recommended a reduction in of pursuing a reduction of LDLC as a method because they believed They couldn't. The way they actually put it was that they couldn't actually see a change in the food culture, which just seemed like a lot of people were pushing probably at the time statins and things like that later on as that progressed. But it was that sort of thinking, we can't change the food culture, so let's mitigate the amount of circulating LD or that can be oxidised. Well, that doesn't seem logical to me, so that doesn't make sense. So it did. Further deep dives, and I came across uh, Sally Fallon, and Mary Eanes, and uh, part of the Western A Price Foundation, and started reading some of their literature and some of the talks on the oiling of America, which later became a video, all that, which I went through and looked at the, a lot of the citations of the studies that they had actually um, quoted and realised, okay, this is really dangerous this stuff, and it's in everything. So it meant that once I realised that, then later on, I looked at some of Laszlo Boris's and the Hungarian research that comes out of some old Russian research in the 1960s, which has to do with deuterium isotopes. So that the high levels of deuterium tend to, because you can get in seed oils up to 255 parts per million, anything over 180, you're busting your nanomotors, your ATPAs in your mitochondria. And so once I started understanding the consequences of those sort of factors, I realised, okay, these foods need to go because they're so damaging to the ability to produce energy to heal. And so to heal, I need to fix these things. Then I came across more research that showed me that taurine, which I've been on for well over a decade now, has these the ability of lower glycation, fix, but actually has the ability to manipulate water to lower entropy in the inside the body and improve protein folding, which is one of the major hallmarks of aging. So once I realized how to fix misfolded proteins in my body, I started changing a lot of the things that I did. As I said, I started getting into these biohacks, going to into low carb diets. Then I went keto for a while and started doing a lot of green leafy vegetables. For about five years, I suffered with kidney stones and I realized that's not really working. So I've jettisoned that whole concept and slowly at over a number of probably three years, slowly moved towards an Everest diet without even realizing it. And then I came across other research because at the time I did look at low fat diets like Walter Kempner's 1930 research. And I, I realized, okay, there's something strange here. In a low-carb state, the John Hopkins University Hospital was looking into the ketogenic diets, and then in these low-fat diets, you get certain similar effects, upregulation of AMPK, uncoupling of mitochondria. A lot of similar things are happening. One is less nutrient-dense, and usually people like on a vegan diet, they have that a fasting-mimicking diet effect over the first couple of years, but later on they suffer from deficiencies. And I realized that from, and that's why I didn't even bother with veganism or, or vegetarianism. Cause probably the thing that put me off was one of my, two of my work colleagues are vegetarian and they weren't in great health. So I said, that's not going to be the, the way to go. And nobody was doing low carb at the time. So I said, why not give it a try? I did try for a while paleo, but it didn't work for me. Later on, I realized that I had a gene, some gene. I was one of those 24% with genetic predisposition for 
the ability to absorb calcium. It's a sort of a what populations that are exposed to high levels of dairy, like pastoral, and I do have pastoral genes in me because my both sides of fa- my family come from mountainous area in Greece, which was very pastoral background, goats, sheep, that, that sort of stuff. So I realised, okay, I need to gravitate towards those sort of foods that I'm going to feel better and function better. I'm going to have the sort of the giveaway was why I abandoned paleo was that I started getting heart palpitations. It was because of low serum calcium because I, I abandoned calcium rich foods. So I shifted back to those and that sort of helped me correct my calcium problem. At the time, I didn't really know until later on, but it was, it's been a, an interesting ride. Then I came across Bart K. You probably know him, Professor Bart K from New Zealand. And I realized he was talking about the Randall cycle, how that works. And that sort of made sense why you could have these extreme sort of effects or the, the similar effects on being very low carb or very low fat. So that sort of cleared up a lot of confusion that I've had. I've seen a lot of Jack Cruz's stuff. Not that I, I don't necessarily subscribe to his ideas. I think diet plays a bigger role than light. It does, light does play a role. There is a bit of a difference between the two in my personal belief from stuff that I've looked at. So it's been a, an interesting ride through scientific literature, trying to understand how the body works, why it works like this what's causing what and realizing that we've been let's say duped or maybe confused a lot of us from reductionist research and from epidemiological research which is very poor in the way data is collected it's horrified me to once i started looking at it see how poorly it's been conducted for the last quite a few decades yeah so these are the sort of things that you Okay. Interesting. I want to delve in because you keep mentioning taurine. There was a recent uh, study came out, gosh, maybe two, three weeks ago, talking about yep. taurine and its potential to extend life significantly, particularly these are animal studies, of course, you can't yes, really extrapolate. But w- tell us about, because I, I think you're a pretty big proponent of taurine. Why taurine? Taurine is obviously found primarily in animal products. You can get it in it. energy drinks. They put taurine in occasionally, but Generally, it's you're going to find that in animal products. So why? What about taurine? Why is taurine so special? They put it in energy drinks, and I don't recommend people consume taurine and, and caffeine. Now, the um, food scientists have realised that you can put a small amount of taurine that can amplify the effects of caffeine. Now, that's not necessarily a good thing in terms of um, heart health or mears and palpitations. But there's really solid research showing that. If you have it without these sort of plant compounds, you tend to have a better regulation of arrhythmias and stuff like that. So it also prevents left ventricular hypotrophy. So it's really good for especially athletes that are doing steady state cardio and stuff like that. Definitely it reduces, it increases GABA ray, it amplifies melatonin at night, which helps with, especially in the mitochondria, which helps with healing the, the damage of just generally metabolism in it. And it has a number, it affects a number of pathways throughout the body. It's an osmolite. It regulates all the ions in the body. You can actually make sure that your body keeps potassium and magnesium inside the cell and calcium and um, sodium in the bloodstream. Primarily, it also has a mild effect similar to blood pressure meds it lowers blood pressure but it's more regulates it's more of a, a regulator like, like I call it a master regulator throughout the body because it actually if you like for women if they've got really low blood pressure it usually brings it to the normal range if men have got higher blood pressure it usually brings it down to the normal range so it regulates and it actually also acts as a calcium channel blocker slide in it has a similar effect to one of those medications so I usually re- do say to people that if you're going to use taurine above any, the lower ranges of you know, like two grams a day, split in small amounts with meals, I would, and if you're on blood pressure meds or on lithium, because it does hold on to lithium, you have to be very careful. You have to get your meds adjusted and stuff like that. And I do have a video 
pr- providing that information because I don't want people to take any risks with their health while they're transitioning away from medications and stuff like that. But the doing a lot of deep dives, it also have, has things like the longevity st- stuff. I don't buy the sort of the notions. I don't think unless you've got longitudinal um, research, you can't really make the claims that some of these studies make. I see it from more a senescence, that it actually lowers immune senescence and cellular senescence. And it also um, improves protein folding in the brain. It actually also increases um, new brain cells. So that's why children need a lot of it from their breast, from breast milk when they're young. It actually is important for bile salts as well. So it has a whole lot of functions throughout the whole body. Uh, and many others that we probably don't know, but there are a lot of associations in that regard. But in my personal view, I think that it's working on a lot of different levels on lowering glycation, lowering lactate levels. That's why it gives athletes longer sort of the ability to train for longer and uh, it also damage to um, muscle tissue. So all these sort of things seem to have a bit of an advantage. Um, I do also encourage People, when they like fasting to use a bit because it actually means that they don't need to use electrolytes and stuff like that. It regulates without affecting their fast and autophagy. But yeah, so it has a lot of uses here and there. And taurine, as you mentioned, taurine comes in animal foods. It's, it's particularly rich in things like shellfish, I think is probably one of the better sources right. of, of taurine. Beef yeah. beef has a de- reasonable amount. It does. What what sort of amounts are you looking at to get these supposed benefits? It, de- it depends on what people's problems are. Most people, probably between two and six grams is all they need. But I was doing about 20 grams at much higher dose, and I was spreading that throughout the day. So I wasn't having it as one hit. So that's what I was doing as a therapeutic dose to reduce fibrosis in my body. Now that's uh, you can't you you clearly can't get that much taurine in in food. That's that would be almost impossible to get twenty grams. I'll food, give you think. well. I'll give you an example. If you were to have definitely not in food, you wouldn't be able to get those sort of levels. The way I view it is, most people that are healthy that don't have any severe health problems. Probably a few grams is all they need, or just eating more seafood. Seafood tends to be very high in it. So having seafood a couple of times a, a week is probably a good idea. If we look at the sort of the N15 data from the collagen long bones of our ancestors, we do find that the uh, ancestors consumed primarily ruminant animals, but also they did consume um, some coastal or river fish. So they were getting some of this sort of stuff in their diet as well. Um, so having looked at a lot of archaeological evidence for that as well has been one of my big interests to work out what a species appropriate diet is. So I've looked into the archaeological evidence, especially the N15 data out of the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, Germany. So a lot of their data going through that has cleared up a lot of confusion for me. They've got a very good collection of bones from around the world which is useful data. And looking also at the type of foods that our ancestors consumed, you can see from the Delta 13 carbon, because that signifies that the animals were eating C4 grasses. So that sort of clears up a lot of that sort of information for me on the dietary side. So it's when we're looking at taurine, I would say if you, let's say you have 100 grams of oysters, which is, 3.53 3.53 ounces of in, in uh, what the non-metric world uses, you get about 2.2 grams of taurine. That's very high. And I can tell you that I can eat more than 100 grams of oysters in one sitting if I'm having that. So there are certain foods. It depends on, obviously, a freshly slaughtered animal is different compared to an animal that's slaughtered, hung up in a refrigeration system and not um, consumed basically a number of weeks later. And obviously the taurine levels, because it's in the fluids, you lose some of that taurine as you lose some of those fluids and the actual the tissue dries up slightly. A freshly slaughtered animal would have double the taurine. So you'd get for 100 grams, you'd get something like more like three to 400 
so milligrams where in the refrigeration system it can be anywhere between 50 and 200 so it can be quite reduced in comparison so there is that side as well and so it's really hard unless you're eating sufficient protein people have a lot of fear of protein i don't i consume about two grams per kilo of body weight which is probably nearly a gram per pound because i don't have any fear of that so i get a one-to-one between fat but I, the way i view it is prioritize for your weight exactly what you need for your body size and composition and then consider the energy requirements that you need for your body and it's listen to your body i've had to learn that in a hard way to listen to my body and knowing what i should be putting in and what i shouldn't so that's been a, a bit of a, a learning curve for a lot of us especially in the modern world where we've lost our food culture so to speak yeah, fair enough. Yeah, we definitely are. What we eat today, no way resemble what we ate. Gosh, certainly not even that long ago. So clearly an advocate of taurine, animal products, not a fan of seed oils. There is, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this, this other philosophy as espoused by the, the late Ray Pete. And he has a lot of, I guess, yes. people that support his belief that we should be consuming. Similarly, that we should, saturated fat is okay seed oils are a problem, but we should consume lots of sugar because that's our body's fuel for preferred fuel source. And then if we are con- continuously providing ourselves sugar, we become hyper cortisol. We have hyper cortisolism and it's going to drive stress and cause all kinds of problems long-term. What are your thoughts on that? Or do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Pretty much no, pretty much nonsense. I've done a few videos of, about Ray Pete and pulling his arguments apart to a large extent. The nonsense are based on reductionist research and based on a lot of research done in the general community. Who are the people who, if you go back to the 1950s and 60s when the diet, when pre-refrigeration, when the diet was primarily animal-based and seasonal plants, these issues didn't exist. And people to make a claim that uh, our problem is the amount of animal foods when we flipped the sort of pyramid and we're consuming something like 70% plants nowadays that is the um, the best thing and people are just getting worse it's just ridiculous and even the whole foods sort of whole foods movement where people are consuming more plants they're still getting sicker i see them atrophying vegetarians that actually don't eat seed oils and stuff like that and they atrophy and they have health problems or of all sort of all types so i don't buy that argument my father got into that in the sit when he was in his 70s And that's what actually made me look at dad and say, you need to change your diet. And I was just coming out of a year after surgery at the time and started to realise a lot of the nonsense out there. And he's radically changed his health and improved his health. His kidney cancer has halved since he's become more carnivorous. His kidneys have actually, that were atrophying, have actually increased in size and so are much healthier which has helped him also reduce his blood pressure. So a lot of things have improved. And seeing all these, that yes, are in the one anecdotes, but as I say, the proof's in the pudding and noticing the changes in my own health, I'm convinced that if our ancestors, the ancestral data that indicates that we were hyper super carnivore for most of our existence, I don't buy those sort of arguments of rapeatism and stuff like that. Then there's also some people in the ex-carnivores or people in the low-carb community that have really incorporated carbs back in, and usually they argue that there's an effect on GLP-1, increasing glucagon like peptide 1, and I usually say to them, so does protein and so does calcium. Maybe you could be one of those people like me that have genetics that affect calcium uptake. And that could be affecting your blood sugar going up. I've actually made a video on that, explaining some of that information, how it works. And there's then when it comes to the cortisol, that's more nonsense. Now, on a low carb, like a a plant based, and that's the, the problem. Since Atkins, we've moved like the new Atkins sort of approach, which is in the low carb community, which promotes a more plant based orientated low carb diet which is becoming more prominent nowadays. If you take a look at that, what does it do? It actually lowers the amount of amino acids. And I've done a recent video showing that amino acids, when you get a good enough amount in your food intake, actually lower 
some of these pathways that are criticised. So the carnival diet has an, an effect that amino acids, the more amino acids you get into your system, which is what a carnival diet does, it actually lowers the cortisol levels. So that's the research actually shows something completely different. So the, the sort of argument that these people are putting forward is a very spurious argument. It doesn't hold up. Then he has arguments about PUFA and argues that you should use sugar as your fuel and not animal foods because they do, especially pork, does contain some level of animal PUFA. That's nonsense as well. In the food matrix of animal foods, it's much more stable. You would have to cook meat, and I've actually shown some of the research, up to 32 hours before you got anything above trace levels. And in a low-carbohydrate state where you've got upregulation of glutathione, um, um, catalase and superoxide dismutase, these sort of intracellular antioxidants, your body's more than enough capable of dealing with trace levels. So even after 32 hours, you're actually getting levels which are similar like to the oxidation, primary, secondary oxidative products and aldehydes, similar to olive oil, extra virgin, cold pressed olive oil. So I don't buy that argument about poofers as well that the Ray Pete sort of fan club put out there that you need sugar as an alternative because you can eliminate all the potential so-called risks. And at the same time, Poofer actually is lower in deuterium, which is actually safer for, for the actual mitochondria. That means the type of metabolic water that's produced in the mitochondria is pretty much going to be much lower in the sort of damaging, sort of you're not going to get the neutrons. So just for people that may not understand what I'm talking about, when we take in food, whether it's protein for the use to produce energy in our bodies, we take a food mass of whether fat or carbohydrates or those sugars, those simple sugars, they will have their carbon backbone used, will actually be combined with oxygen. Part of it will be used for protein synthesis and the rest of it will be just exhaled out as carbon dioxide. What you do take in is protons and pro hydrogen ions. Now you can have two types. One is called deuterium, which is heavy water, and the other one is lighter, which is called H1 or hydrogen, plain hydrogen, whatever you want to call it. That's what we want more of, and we want to take that into the mitochondria and put it through the electron chain. For those who understand what I'm saying, strip the electrons for the redox potential to power up the pumps, and those pumps will pump through the actual protons those pro protons, if they can build up a sufficient gradient, they will push against these little nanomotors producing energy. Now, if you consume foods that are very high in deuterium, that have got these, the nucleus of the actual is made up of a proton and a neutron, that neutron is much larger in size, and that will actually go through those nanomotors and slow them down if too much of that goes through those machines it will bust them. And this is what's happening to us as we age. We have less ability to produce energy. Our, the, our basically cells become more senescent, more damaged, less able to repair themselves. And over time, they can also go cancerous because at some point, I've actually done a lot of, a lot of videos covering cancer and what causes it and how um, I believe it's a mitochondrial disease like Seafried, but I I think also that a lot of reductionist research in the cancer field is concentrated more on the glutamate, sugar and stuff like that, and missing the point that really it's the mitochondria actually signaling back to the nucleus and saying, I can't produce the energy you need because I've got dam da these, these, the machinery is damaged. So you get your, what happens is you go into this sort of reverse Krebs cycle, dragging in deuterium from the cytosol from inside the cell and actually producing lactate and pro providing fermentation. And that's what the upregulation of oncogenes and, and uh, this sort of um, happens because of this signaling back and forward. So you could say both are right, 
but they're looking at things downstream in a sense. They're not really um, recognising the actual damaging effect of the seed oils and the refined sugars that are very high in deuterium. So that's really what's causing a lot of these health problems, not only cancer, a lot of the other health problems is what I've understood from looking at the literature and going into quantum biology and trying to understand how human physiology really works. So it's allowed me to heal myself by understanding how my body works in a sense. So it's been a long journey for the last decade or so, but it's been a well worthwhile and it's allowed me to help other people providing insights. I don't provide any medical advice, obviously, because I'm not a doctor. I usually do encourage people to go to a sort of a low-carb physician if they need to manage or people that, that are qualified for that. But I do try and provide people with the signs and the ammunition, so to speak, to be able to go to those people and say, this is what's happening inside my body. I need you to work with me, stuff like that. So that's my sort of aim of my channel, that and a few other things. Yeah, I, I guess so. You mentioned you're not a fan of seed oils. You, you, unlike Ray Pete, you don't think refined sugar is particularly good for us. You're a fan of taurine. You're a fan of animal products. What other things are you advocating for? And, and I, I guess, let me go back to your heart attack because you said you reverse fibrosis. So which, how much of your heart was fibrotic and scarred? Do you remember which coronary vessel was it, damaged? Do you, do you remember any of that stuff? I, 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 I don't. My my heart had didn't have a lot of fibrosis. It didn't have a lot of scarring. It was much less. My left lung had, was completely glassed over for whatever reason. I don't know why that was the case. My last scan in um, 2019 showed that it reduced to about 19%. So it had, and this I put a tribute down to taurine, and uh, um, vitamin um, D as well. So I've maintained a good vitamin D status um, and I have a good balance between retinol and vitamin D and I believe that that's critical. There are key cofactors in certain enzymes that are involved in collagen turnover, the matrix metalloproteinases, I've MMPs as they call it for short, and I've realised that they have a lot of effect in the type of, can, too many of them, can actually generate a lot of fibrosis in the body, so less of them. Also, there is an interaction between those enzymatic pathways and also deuterium, because deuterium also has the ability, you need some deuterium, because it has the ability to to stiffen or to give rigidity to collagen structures. But too much, you tend to have people that... As they, they accumulate more deuterium, tend to get, have this, they become more stiffer in their, their body, their tissue. Too little is not a good. It's not, um, it means that your collagen structures are, don't have as much rigidity. Bones tend to have more deuterium, which is a good thing because the, it's mineralized collagen at the end of the day. So it needs to be, its highest concentration is in the bones, which is fine. The, and the sweet spot is what we find in animal food. So grass-fed, grass-finished animal foods tend to be within the sweet spot of 100, 130, which is about 115, with bacon being the lowest at 113. I don't know why. I think it's just a part of the animal where it has the ability to better lower deuterium. Orky or piggy, as I call it, and it tends to be better in that regard. Animals that are grain-fed tend to be at around 120-odd, 122, 124, or slightly higher, up to 126, but still below that of olive oil, 130. So it's still within that sort of safe zone of providing a sort of balance between some that the body needs for its collagen structures, but not too much. So it's a nice balance that you find in, in the animal foods. So I'm convinced that animal foods work much better with our physiology from all the sort of research that I've looked at. As far as the fibrosis in my lung, my left lung, I don't know what it is at the moment. I'm supposed to go back for a scan. Uh, I haven't done that yet. I'm reluctant to be putting myself through machines, which, you know, zap me with radiation (laughs) nowadays because I've seen the progress. I've gone from complete glassing where I could have ended up with cancer. And that's the reason why I dug deep into the cancer area because I also was a smoker in the past and I feared that I would have 
cancer from my symptoms. I didn't realize was uh, I'd had a heart attack. So there was a bit of confusion because nobody else had a heart condition in my family on either side to this day. I'm the first. So it was a shock to everyone. So yeah, it was completely off, off um, uh, left field, so to speak. So it wasn't something that would have been expected in my family to, to occur. But going back, looking at my diet, I realized that I consumed a lot of seed oils. I somehow got convinced in my twenties, mid twenties, that seed oils were, I remember reading something in Scientific America and I was convinced that was the way to go for heart health. I started using it for a lot of things. So maybe that overconsumption in the end nearly cost me my life. And the pseudoscience in that article nearly <laughs> seemed to nearly kill me, in my personal opinion. there Obviously, there are advocates that seed oils are not deleterious. In fact, they may even be beneficial. They'll make the claim that there are no, there's no human data that supports the claim that seed oils are indeed problematic. And I've seen people that have pushed back against that, but you, I think well, I've seen well, something, well, let me, sorry. Yeah. I think I've seen yeah. something where you've talked about if seed oils are detrimental to us and they build up, we have certain problematic chemicals that build up in our body. This is something that can be reversed over time with Tech supplements or food or something like that. Can you go into that a little bit? Or maybe you can talk about the people that promote seed oils as being heart healthy and it lowers our LDL cholesterol and therefore that's the best thing in the world type of stuff. What are your thoughts on those things? I think it probably works through a number of different mechanisms. Probably one of the mechanisms would be phytosterols that, that are very high in seed oils and tend to seem to lower LDLC from the animal studies, that is. But they're a problem as well because when they get incorporated into your red blood cells, what happens is red blood cells need to have cholesterol to elongate through very, your vascular tree has got a lot of the arteries through it, are different sized, some are very thin, very, and these red blood cells need to elongate to get through those. And if they're not able to do those too stiff because of phytosterols, that's going to create potential hypoxia problems in certain areas. Just from that, I see them as a danger and people supplementing and encouraging the supplementation of phytosterols is, it's, it's madness to even promote that sort of stuff when there is research showing quite clearly that it has this stiffening effect to red blood cells and just extrapolating from that is going to, has the potential risk to produce hypoxia in certain regions. So that's just one element. But the key, the two key factors that I consider seed oils pro problematic is now if you take, let's say, like a nut oil, like nuts, you eat nuts, for instance. Now they do have a lot of anti nutrients in them that are problematic, but just the nut itself, the fats in those are actually low in deuterium. So in the fats of those they are, but when you actually go through an industrial process, because our, the oils that are produced, they are produced in a refinery, like an oil refinery. That's the same sort of, and in those sort of environments, you're talking about heating them and what happens is as you process anything, you lower the amount of, you change the composition of the, the hydrogen ions. You end up ending up with more and more hydrogen ions that are, deter that are deuterium heavy water and the light water actually gets lost as a consequence of the industrial process. Most processed foods will actually increase deuterium rather than reduce it because of this industrial process, the way it works. But beyond that, then you've got the deuterium side of pro problem that you're actually damaging your mitochondria on the one hand, and then you've got the oxidation of uh, potentially with the primary and secondary oxidative products because of this industrial process, because of the double bonds that exist in omega-6s in particular, you have, and then you've got a higher increase in aldehydes. And I've shown a lot of research where it actually shows that these industrial seed oils are very high in aldehydes and these primary and secondary oxidative products. And that's another mechanism where I believe they're causing inflammation in the body and a lot of oxidation. And they're also affecting the mitochondria in a number of ways where they're increasing. Not only are they putting more 
um, neutrons in there damaging the the ATPAs, the complex five, as it's called, which is where that little nanomotor that spins around at 9,000 RPMs, if it's got a good proton gradients behind it, or much less if it doesn't, or it's got neutrons going through it and impeding it. But then on the other hand, these, the cardiolipin, which is right after complex four, you've got that, which is omega-6, primarily it's an omega-6 type fatty acids that make it up. And you can actually have these industrial seed oils, which are quite damaging. You're trying to incorporate into that and damaging and creating some leakage. And then you end up with proton leakage through there, which creates a whole lot of other problems inside the mitochondria. And I believe that it's from all these type of things that are happening due to the seed oils that are causing a lot of these problems. Now, obviously, when you just look at LDLC being lowered and the pseudoscience that believes that LDLC is a problem, then you end up extrapolating from that in a pseudo way that if this actually lowers LDLC, it must be good. And that's how the literature has actually pushed it and promoted it, even though there is no science to actually indicate that at all. When we look at epidemiological research, the what they call the relative risk, which I think is a, an oxymoron, it's really an odds ratio, it's less than two, which is not even sufficient statistically for a hypothesis, let alone to extrapolate anything beyond that. The odds ratios of tobacco is between 10 and 30, which is massive orders of difference in thousands of percent. It's just statistical noise, and that's what it's all based on. And their arguments are based on epidemiological um, data, not on experimental data. And when we look at experimental data, that's only pretty much conducted in animals because you can't lock up humans for, for years or decades to really do proper experiments. We do see an increase in oxidative stress in these animals. But a lot of the, a lot of the studies are done in a very, what I would call the wrong way, the design of the studies, even the animal ones. So you have to be careful. You have to look at the design, learn, I say to people, to look at the how it was designed and then you can work out. So there are certain chow profiles that they use for the rats and they tend to have a lot of seed oils in them. They put lard and they put oddidextrose, stuff like that. And when you look at the profile, you realise, okay, this is like a mixed diet that you would get on a sad, um, sad diet, what they call the high-fat diet, is really a sad diet, the mimicking of a sad diet. And we know that is problematic due to the Randall cycle that I've understood from Bart K and due to the a lot of the oxidative products that the seed oils are going to incorporate. But when you actually exclude that and, and start using actual true animal foods, you don't see that. There's one study there that I show people where they induced in rats cancer and they gave just standard bacon to the rat. There was other, the, the other rats, the control was on, a, on the chow. The other rats were on certain other foods and they just gave bacon to one group of rats. And that group of rats had actually a reduction or of their colon cancer, which they induced. Once you start seeing those, I know it's a mechanistic study, it is, but it actually does show that there is a reverse causation there, that there is no, because if something, as Bradford Hill would say, who developed the Bradford Hill criteria of epidemiology, as he explained, unless all his criteria met, you can't have something which actually shows the complete opposite effect and for something to be causal. If it's causal, it always has to associate all the time. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. And so understanding how epidemiological and meta-analysis are actually manipulated has actually helped me. I have to thank uh, Professor Bart Kay for his really great work that he does in explaining a lot of this sort of stuff and actually improving my skills as well in looking at the literature and analysing some of this sort of stuff to be able to demystify it for my subscribers and other people but also to clear up a lot of confusion in my head and for many others, I suspect, 
that, that listen to the stuff that I talk about. Yeah, that's the sort of things. With that, unfortunately, Harry, and I appreciate there's been a lot of information. We're unfortunately running out of time. Yep. You said you've got another. Where do people go to to hear more of what you're talking about? Because there's obviously a lot of information here, and I'm sure there's a lot more. Yeah, where, do, where do people find you on internet, YouTube, social media? Yeah. Where, where do you go? So I'm pretty much on YouTube primarily. I do I do have a place on some of the other social media, but it's more for family purposes, not for it's not something that I maintain. I do have a Twitter account, which is also Harry Sapanos. And so people can actually go and see a few of the links that I put up there. I don't put a lot of stuff. It's primarily I use the Twitter account to go through other people's blogs and stuff like that and or um tweets and argue <laughs> against some of the nonsense. Uh, so that's one area that I spend a bit of time. You you may come across some of my comments um, on Twitter occasionally, uh, but primarily um, I'm on YouTube and my handle is at Harry Sopanos. So if you just put that in, you'll find me immediately. You'll find my channel. I do cover a lot of other things currently. I am in the process of creating a new channel that will cover certain controversial issues that are creating a few problems for me in YouTube recently. So I need to take off some of the videos that are that are more controversial that are and just stick to being more more carnivore, more nutritional for the main channel and moving some of my other stuff to the new channel, which will be the controversial stuff. I do cover a lot of geopolitical stuff as well. So if people are interested in what's happening around the world, some background information. I do have some good contacts within people who, within Greece, who are analysts or ex-military or whatever, who've got insights into what's happening, the things that you don't hear on the main media. And I do sometimes come out with announcements and informa- background information that people are completely unaware of. What's And you don't hear about it. You may hear about it years later, but I do keep my ear close to the ground, so to speak, on those other fronts. Okay. Thank you for that, Harry. Like I said, we have to go. Appreciate it. Folks, we have another one today at 1 p.m. If any, 1 p.m. Pacific time, if anybody's interested. Thank you, Harry. I wish you continued success. And the rest of the folks, thanks for being here. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks for the